And in addition to that, I, I have tried and have largely succeeded to become free of that system, which is a jail cell at some level. And now I am living... You put those bars up, right? Yes, we do, every day. And, and I've largely managed to, to recognize the bars for what they are and to break free. And so I think that's another measure of my success is my ability to step outside of the system, see it for what it is, and become relatively free. I mean, none of us, none of us survive long when industrial civilization goes away for a variety of factors, for a variety of reasons. Or even if we remove ourselves right from the system so far i mean you're gonna go live in the wilderness and and you know eat grass or something and i know a couple of people who do that yeah. you know members of my former tribe in new mexico yeah. who are primitivists who hunt gather but they still use money anarcho-primitives i i don't know that they would allow themselves to be classified That's in that way or any other but but they are, they are capable of living off the land yeah. in the strictest sense, but they use money. Yeah. Because in one case, the, the man really likes beer and he hasn't perfected beer making yet. <laughs> He's trying to make mead right, from man. honey, but, <laughs> but, but he isn't there yet. So he's been doing this for more than, apple cider. more than 35 years. He's been yeah. living off the land, but he still uses money. He can make all of his clothes he and gather all of his food. For his 12 pack. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, I recycle the cans. <laughs> Come on, McPherson, and, don't make fun of me. <laughs> and the other one lived in the nearby wilderness for 25 years. Yeah. And now he's part of the monetary system. Yeah. It, there's, it's, you can't, there's no escape. Well, right. I, yeah, I mean, I, you kind of wonder. I mean, you know, you even, you, I, I always look at groups, for example, the Inuits. Mm -hmm. which most people call it Eskimos. Right. You know, but, but the Inuit, you know, culture, you know, 50 years ago, yeah, they had dog sleds and all that stuff. But, I mean, today, forget it. You know, right. they, they run on gasoline, diesel generators, right. and rifles. And would have a very difficult time without them anymore. Right, right. I mean, because you, you, the old ways have been long forgotten. Exactly. And, and, and once, once we adopt technology, it's really difficult to go back the other way. Yeah, yeah. I mean. <laughs> you know, once you go from landline to cell phone, it's tough to go back. I know you haven't been, made that step yet, and good for you. <laughs> <laughs> and no, then, I have a flip phone. And then once you go from flip phone to smartphone, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody who's willing to go back willingly. Smartphone. Right? Oh. I mean, it's just the okay, culture Mr. we're born Smarty into. Okay, Mr. Smarty Pants. <laughs> flip phone. I, I want to get a. I want to get a. My bumper sticker is, "My phone is smarter than your honor student." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Do you even have a car these days? I do. I drove my 2003 Saturn View through Mexico to Belize. No way. And that was you quite an adventure. You drove that damn thing all the way yeah. down there? Really? Yeah, I put new tires on it in, I don't know, Brownsville, or as soon as I went across the border. And I don't drive it very much because every time I take it out, I swear this is its last trip. Yeah. Because it just makes all kinds of noise and stuff. Because yeah. the roads are bad and stuff yeah. down there. The roads are bad, the car is bad, the, the infrastructure is bad. in Belize, right? Yes. I mean, you're, you're, you're uh, settled in. Been there for about a year. Yeah. Have a wonderful group of people I live with. There's about 10 adults living on the 57 acres, um, all with, you know, family quarters. Uh, Lily and her sons in a cabin, and Ugo and Marta, and now probably their baby in a cabin, and, and Daniel in, in his cabin, and Walter, and so on. So. You build but, composting toilets and stuff yeah, like that? Yeah. 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 So. We're, we have compost and toilet. We use rainwater, uh, filtered rainwater for domestic water supply. I've got rainwater over we here. Use, we use gray water, gray water for watering the plants and so on. And so, you know, we're, we're trying to do many of the same things I did at the Mud Hut, trying to, to take what I call right action or, or what a Buddhist might call right action and not being attached to the outcome because we're doing all these things, these, quote, low impact ways of living and we're screwed anyway. Yeah, it is, that, is, that is the hardest darn thing to think about is, you know, taking that right action and 
not holding on, not grasping that hot coal. Yeah. You know, is is what uh, you know. I've, I've read a few things about Siddhartha, and he talks about that hot coal. Yeah. That you hold on to that, thinking it's going to burn that other person, and uh, it, it just it burns you. And and that's why forgiveness is a gift to yourself, not to the person you're forgiving. Yeah. Forgiving is letting go. Yeah. Let go or be dragged. And if you're unwilling to forgive another person, you're being dragged along at every step. And it's tough. It's hard because that person wronged me. You know, and I, I get all that. I've been wronged myself a time or two. Well, yeah, I mean, come on. You know, I mean, we can, we can all go through our lives and, and look back and say something was done and then you know, somebody else can look at you or me or whoever and say, yeah, well, what about you? And then exactly. one day they... Right. <laughs> that we don't even remember. Well, or, right? So, so I find that in forgiving people... Don't want to remember. <laughs> I find that in forgiving people, if I actually told them in my out loud voice, Dave, I forgive you for that time you stepped on my cat, you're like, you had a cat? You wouldn't even remember that. It was such an insignificant, it was a big deal to me. You don't even like cats. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> what the hell but are you, you talking it was, about? <laughs> so, that's, you know, that's most of what we do. The things that we, that we take so personally and that hurt us and so badly. That to, to other people, they're like, what are you, th what are you even talking about? They're you, minor do you issues. Think, do you think that your, you know, your academic education and background that got you to this point right now where you're talking about Siddhartha. I mean, would you be talking about this if you hadn't become a professor emeritus, you know? Do you think it's, it's hard to say. It was in my early 30s that I started reading philosophy that took me back to the ancients. Yeah. And... Diogenes of and, Right, right. Is there an honest man? <laughs> and so would I have done that? if I weren't in the academy. Yeah. Well, one of the advantages of being at a university, of being a university professor, is that you're actually paid to think. You're expected to take time to read and to think and pursue scholarship. If I had been uh, a lumberjack. If I'd been a lumberjack or I had been a road maintenance repair guy. Right, there you go. Would I have read ancient philosophy? I don't know. I might have done it at night. I found it very compelling once I stumbled onto it, yeah. and I really read a lot after, after that. I didn't have to read that. In fact, I wasn't expected to read that yeah. for my job. Right. But I was paid to think. And so it's hard to say whether I would have gone that route or not. I certainly wouldn't have had the audience I ended up having if it's I were... It's what if. Right. Yeah. We don't know those things. Yeah. Right, so exactly. You, uh, what's the other one you don't like is hope? Yeah, hope. You know, you, you uh, have kind of cast that away as being I'm hope-free. Hope-free. I'm hope-free. What I'm does not that a, mean? Though? It means that I'm not attached to the outcome, really. So instead of hoping for the best, instead of hoping I live another 35 years, instead of hoping that this society turns things around and we stop killing every other organism on the planet. Instead of hoping all those things, I'm hope free. I'm not attached to the outcome any, anymore. I'm going to do what I believe is right for the given circumstance, but I'm not under any illusion that that will improve the global situation. That's what being hope fear, free means for me. And the other side of that coin is fear. fear. Hope and fear, the two four-letter words on the I don't know the future coin. Yeah. I don't fear the future. A lot of people are afraid of what might happen down the road. A lot of people are afraid of death. So you're flipping that coin. I'm hoping, I'm afraid. Yeah. And I one way or the other. I fear that I might die. No, I know that I'm going to die. Well, right. I hope that I live 35 years. I don't hope for that. And, and that takes me back to being more fully present in the given moment. Because I, I'm not projecting in either direction into the future. I'm living now. 
And so even when I'm with guys like you. <laughs> Wait a second. I'm not so sure I resemble that remark. I try, I try to be present with, with the ones I'm with. Guys like you. How many guys like me do you link up with? Just one so far. <laughs> For better and worse. Well, you know, no, I, I, you know, I mean, uh, what was it? It was March. You know, I, I, I've taken up your habit of, of remembering these these dates and stuff because you'll do that. The IPCC in January of 2010. <laughs> no, but it was March of, of 2014 when you know you come up here and uh, you know I hosted you and we did a few talks and stuff and now here it is 2017 more than three years July. later hi and and I've been following your work I, I do diligently follow your work and I do try to I do try to kind of you know say hey people take a look at this you know I, I I don't have much success and I've asked you this question over and over again I mean how do we have this conversation this conversation that, folks, you know, it's, it's what, what did Bugs Bunny say? That's all, folks. <laughs> you know? Is that what he said? Something like that? You know, Wasn't and, that it, Porky Pig who did the... Well, b -b 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 that's all, folks? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think they all did it. But, but, but the, the It was part of the contract with Warner Brothers or whoever yeah. that was. Yeah. It was the same guy. It was, uh, what's his name, that... Uh, Max, what was his name? Out Max there? Headroom? No, 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 Max no, no. Headroom? the guy that did the voices for oh. those cartoons. There was one guy, his name was oh. Max. You know I there. don't know. You know in TV land. But anyway, on his gravestone it said, that's all, folks. Really? Yes. Oh, was, that's awesome. It was Max, uh, look it up on your little device. Yes. But either way, no, no, I, you know, I've asked you this question many times and it's very difficult because just having the conversation and, and you know, asking people around, you say, do you realize what we've done, what we're doing as a species on this planet and where it's headed? And do you understand that between here, the ground, and up there is about 10 miles. It's a little tiny, thin layer of atmosphere. Upon we, which we completely depend for our own survival. Uh, right, right. What do, what do you say about uh, try counting your money? You know, right. right. If you think the economy is more important than the environment, try holding, holding your breath your while breath. counting your money. Yeah, while yeah. you count your money. And and but but really, I mean, I I, I came across this. It, it was a couple months ago where it was pointed out that it's about ten miles. So you get in your car or walk ten miles and realize that between. Terra firma here and up there is 10 miles mm -hmm. of atmosphere. Mm -hmm. It ain't that much. Mm -hmm. And and yet people go, oh no, we can't change it. We don't. Are you kidding? Humans aren't going to do anything mm -hmm. about that. You know, come on. Are you kidding? No, no. And by the way, we can drive from sea level to about two miles. Yeah. That's just the, the shade over 10,000 feet, right? Yes. So we can actually drive one fifth of the way yes. through that atmosphere. Yes. Yes. That's how thin it is. Yes. Very we got roads thin. piercing part way up. Right, right. And 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 yet people are just not I don't know, what's the word? Cogent, cognizant of the idea that, that humans would do this and and uh, you know, wreck the whole thing. Well, we don't want to believe that we could do such a thing. It's not really any one individual's fault. It wasn't Svente Arrhenius who, put, who wrote the first it journal Sisyphus. paper. It, it, was, it wasn't Sisyphus. That's it wasn't George Perkson's Marsh. It wasn't the CEO of Exxon in 1964. It wasn't any of those individual people. It was all of us. Yeah. And who wants to take responsibility for that? Right. Nobody. And, and, and similarly, no single person is going to be able to fix it either. So it's a mess, and we don't want to know about a mess that we can't fix. Uh, I think so. <laughs> I mean, you can make that I've case, accused, right? I've been accused of being a nihilist. As have and I. I thought, well, wait a second. Nihilist? What do you mean? That sounds, that sounds terrible. It sounds like a bad thing, doesn't it? Yeah, doesn't it? I mean, really. I think, no, I'm just, how about realist? Is a realist a nihilist? Right. 
You know? I mean, think about that. It, nihilism is all about where you get your existential anchor, <laughs> where you find that. Yeah. And for some people, it's in religion. For some people, it's in some brand of philosophy. For some people, whatever. Looking and, up the IPCC papers right. and, <laughs> and, and posting if, them online. <laughs> if you got no existential anchor, then you're a nihilist or a nihilist. Oh. Nihilist? Is it yeah. nihilist or nihilist? Uh, I've heard it both ways. Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either, but I've been accused of being a nihilist. Nihilist. Yeah. yeah. I'm not so, surprised. Oh, oh, you just don't have hope? Isn't that what it kind of means? You just don't have hope? It, that you don't have a belief system that, as near as I can tell, matches other people's belief systems. I see. Okay, so for most people that goes right to hope. Because religions, for example, are all about hope. I mean, that's one of the big four. Is it four? Hope, faith, chastity, money. No, that's not right. Money? Well, there's <laughs> plenty of money in church. <laughs> Pass that hat around. Maybe there's just three. Hope, faith, chastity. I don't know. I don't keep track of that sort of thing. Well, you know, on your tour, you, you uh, did speak at a few churches, didn't you? Yes, I did. Universal, universalists. Uni Unitarian Universalists. Universalist. Yes, yes. Several and of that's those. That's what I am. I am a Unitarian Universalist. Uh -huh. I'm not a member. Mm -hmm. But I, that's what I was brought up as. And so don't speak disparaging. I'm, I'm not. And I, I think I was you hosted in a too. Lutheran church. Was there a Lutheran too? I'm, it was either Lutheran or Methodist. They're right beside each other. And that was the latest one in East Lansing, oh, Michigan. It yeah. It was a Methodist, yeah. yeah. Well, let me see. I think it's right here on this piece of paper. It's got to be there. It's got to be there. Because everything's on this piece of paper. You, you in have in font so small, agent. it's absolutely amazing. Now, is that Robin? Robin is very, very wonderful, yes. And, she and is booking at CrawfordsAttractions.com. Crawford Attractions. Crawford's Attractions. Does she book her own band or anything? She also books for Fast Heart Mart. And she used to be in that band. I don't know if she still plays or not. So she books for me voluntarily and for at least Fast Heart Martin, maybe some others as well. Yeah. I suspect Crawford's Attractions is at crawfordsattractions.com and yeah. you can find out all this stuff. Anyway, she's been very, very good to me. I was in a Lutheran church. I was in a Lutheran church yesterday. And All Souls Unitarian. And so, yeah, a few churches along the way, which is great. And, really? Uh, did you did you meet up with any uh, you know tyrants? <laughs> <laughs> no. That they're... shook their fist at you. And well, Harrison, you don't know what the hell you're uh, talking about. There were a few a few people who it's God's will didn't understand my perspective on hope, and I will admit that we're we're taught pretty much every day in this culture that hope is unimpeachably good, that, that if we think positive, things will turn out better than if we don't think positive. The Oprah syndrome. Right. <laughs> and so I began quoting Fury Road from 2015, the, yeah. the latest Mad Max movie. Yes. At one point, the protagonist turns to somebody and he says, hope is a mistake. If you can't fix what's broken, it'll drive you crazy. <laughs> and I think that's right, and I think that's what hope is. Yeah. Hope is wishing that, that somebody else it. will fix it. Somebody else, or it could be fixed. Or that or it could be fixed, yes. Fix yeah. Yes, right. And I think hope is a mistake, because if you can't fix what's broken, we can't fix climate change. No. Abrupt. Exactly. We can't fix abrupt climate change. And if, if we think we can, and it's actually impossible, then where does that go? That goes to hope being actually quite detrimental to your well-being. Yeah. That's being attached to the outcome. I, I, I just wonder how do you how do you how do you fend off the naysayers? You know, because there's got to be plenty of the people, you know, plenty of people in academia that look at your view and say, "Oh, he's just a, you know an extremist, nihilist, right. nihilist, right. whatever." Sure. I mean, how do you, how do you you know? fend that off as on a regular basis because your message is not mainstream right the mainstream message is oh uh, we're gonna uh, there's gonna be a transition 
Uh, we're gonna right. go to electric cars and uh, ferry gas or something. You know? So lately, what I've been doing is using those two bar paradoxes I already mentioned yeah. at the top of the top of the show here. Yeah. So I talk about the paradox. We either keep the heat engine going, mm -hmm. or we turn it off, and then it heats up even faster because of the lack of the sulfates or the aerosols in the atmosphere. So that's the one paradox. We keep it going and we burn up the planet or we turn it off and burn it up even faster. But, yeah, but, but, but that, that becomes handing an extreme one way or the other and people don't grasp that. You know, people want to see some, right. you know, some middle of the road solution. They don't, you know. And, they, and that's my point. There is no solution. This is a predicament. It is not a problem. And so, so then I point out that the IPCC says is that global warming is irreversible without massive geoengineering the atmosphere's chemistry, and there's no way to do that. So these two paradoxes then go to, but I'm not saying we shouldn't act. Yeah. I'm not promoting or proposing inaction. inaction. I'm saying don't be attached to the outcome. Yeah. And so those are three key points, the two paradoxes, and then the don't be attached to the outcome, but, but keep doing what you believe to be right. And so there you go. I've just been to half of my talk and, and I haven't got into how hot it's going to be, you know, a few years from now, that well, sort of thing. Yeah, so. I, I didn't, it, <laughs> there's plenty of info out there, guymcpherson.com, <laughs> Nature Bats Last, where you can, you too can see the info as to temperature what well, feels pretty comfortable here now feels great doesn't it all right well guy i think we'll call it a day what do you say i think we've covered a lot of territory here and you got a lot of editing ahead of you not me <laughs> i don't edit are you kidding i got other schmoes that edit you're the schmo <laughs> i appreciate the conversation hey, as always guy, Dave. i i think this will be a a, a, a youtube hit we'll, we'll get like 27 millions and millions of views. Like, yeah, they'll look at this and go, oh my God. My life has changed. Ah, I need to share this with everybody I know. I'm quitting my job. Yes. It's it. It's it. You know, I, I, I didn't tell you my secret story about how I quit my job. But you're going to. No, I did. You did? Yeah, I quit working years ago. I know, but I don't remember. Uh, I told you about it. I know you did, but yeah, I, you know, I meet a lot of people. My dad got sick and I quit my oh, right. regular job. I was working 40 hours a week and I thought, you know what? I'm gonna go spend time with dad. Mm -hmm. And that was a good seven or eight years ago. You know, around the time, you know what? It was around the time, I think the first time I saw one of your talks too. And I caught it on YouTube and I thought, man, what? This guy's pretty serious. What? I think it was, you were in Indiana. <laughs> oh, wow. I saw. Was, and, and I think it was from 12. Uh-huh. You know, somewhere in there. Does that sound about right? 2012? And, and You're asking me to recall something well, from okay, five years but, ago? But, but, it, it, was a, it was a defining moment. Because you also were talking about, you know, energy depletion. That you, right. you, uh got into looking at all this business. right you know uh the idea that you know infinite growth on a finite planet sorry folks it doesn't add up gonna work you know and and that was you know for you what was it around you know 22 or something 2002 oh yeah 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 somewhere in there yes i mean the peak oil you know which is a contributor to the move to the mud hut yes where, where you where i started that process in 2007 actually started the process three years before that looking for the place but but part of your drive was that you're looking at this idea that's like we can't keep doing this people right and and that was where i also you know i i started seeing it too i mean i was you know working building maintenance or whatever and i was talking to people about you know look at this peak oil you know and and there's only so much energy in the world now ah, you're full of it hey, right. it's right. cheap Hey, you can't, you can't tell us that. <laughs> I'm getting an SUV, you know. I mean, you know, my friends and stuff would say that stuff to me. Sure. And, and so here it is, 2017, about 15 years later. And the system grinds on. Well, it grinds on, but, but I think that, you know, 
you know, I, I, I think that we find ourselves in, kind of like in a parallel universe in a way. Because like I said, I mean, I quit working, uh, I, I'm going to say, at least six years ago. And, and I just said to hell with it. And I was done. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people say, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with your time? What are you doing? Blah, 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 blah. You know, and, what am I doing with my time? I'm talking to Guy McPherson. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guy. A pleasure, Dave. All right, Thanks. Then we'll call it a day. Thanks again. We'll see you in the funny papers. Mm-hmm.